Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we focus on the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Sharia Saluja. He's the co-founder and CEO of Fleet Labs in San Francisco. And what are they doing? They're pioneering sustainable commuting solutions. Welcome, Sharia. Thank you, Ted, for having us. We're excited to be here. Sharia, let's start, if we can, by defining the concept of the business. You're a pioneer, you say. Tell us about how you're a pioneer in this particular space. That's a, that's a very good word, pioneering, um, as you mentioned. You know, the way we look at it, it's really about helping people see a new way of doing things, right? And, and the idea of having things that are happening in a specific way, in a specific industry, for us, you know, we're tackling transportation and commuting. There are a lot of ways to get from A to B. We're really pioneering how people can change the ways that they're going from A to B to both make it a bit more sustainable and more convenient at the same time. How are you actually making it more sustainable? That's a very good question. So we are actually help making this more sustainable by connecting them to show to to the right options that they have available for them. Right. So we today, as people have more ways to move from point A to point B than we've ever had in the history of humanity, and there's such a thing as choice parallax or you know, lack of awareness. And so we're really coming out to show people all the different possibilities that they have, make the options that are more sustainable or economic more friendly and environmentally more friendly, make them more accessible to people who may not have heard about them before or may not know how to take advantage of them. That's really the core of, of everything we're trying to do. And And how would you define for somebody the problem that you're actually trying to solve? Yeah. Simply put, there's a lot of programming and incentives, and there are a lot of really, really exciting ways that people can actually leverage, you know, greener mobility choices, right? You have bikes and scooters, you have a lot of autonomous, connected, electric, and, and shared mobility. Pool came out as a concept during our time. So there's a lot of really great ways and a lot of great incentives even for people to take these and leverage these mobility modes. But very few people are really able to understand how to make them part of their day-to-day -day life and how they can, you know, kind of impact can they have by doing that as well. So what we're really doing is just kind of bridging that gap and, and to your point, helping people learn about these things more easily helping people opt in and take advantage of whichever services make sense for them while making sure that everything, specifically the technology that's needed to make this work, is working for them instead of them having to jump through hoops and, and learn about things and register on you know different apps and so on as well. So so what sparked the idea in your mind? What what clicked that made you say, wait a minute, there's an idea here. Nobody's doing this, the pioneering aspect. And the whole thing of the sustainable commuting, what what happened? What were the a series of events or the event that clicked and said, there's something here, let's chase this? Yeah, absolutely. It, and, and it does take me back, you know, quite a while even to my time at college. And, and even after that, when we've been kind of working, getting jobs, everyone's kind of in the workforce and seeing what, you know, day-to-day -day life looks like. You know, we saw during our time this surge of, of these new mobility options come in. And everything was very exciting, right? There's all these, the same that we talked about, the bikes and scooters and, and all these interesting things. Now we've got you know, autonomous taxis driving around San Francisco. Even the last few weeks, we've seen, started to see them pop around across the country. So there's a lot of exciting things that we saw. But at the same time, we felt that they were still very, more so just for fun 
and more, you know, just on weekends and, and evenings and maybe for running errands every now and then. But the more systemic sort of Monday to Friday transportation and travel that we're doing as people was still very much etched the way it's been for decades, right? Either you've mm -hmm. got a car and you're running through that process or, you know, you're close enough and, and you're using public transit where you can and you're, you're using the, the subway or the trains, but it's still very much the same. And so we saw, you know, early on that there's this gap that needs to be filled. There's this jump that needs to happen to get a lot of these more interesting ways of moving also happen to be more economical and happen to be better for the environment. How can we help bring these into the fray of actual options for us? Right? Do they, can that even happen? Right. Is that is that possible? How can it happen? And that's really when we saw this whole world of, of commuter benefits and programming through the lens of employers and government agencies and you know, even schools like Stanford University as a as a customer. They play a big role. We saw that Stanford has thousands of students, thousands of faculty and staff, uh, hundreds and thousands of, of you know people running the campus that are coming into campus. So it's almost many cities worth of people that they're influencing, to say the least, on their sort of day-to-day -day commutes and transportation. And that's when we got, you know, front row seats to this world of enterprise mobility and enterprise transportation and saw how much power, you know, employers can wield to help influence employee behavior or help surface the right options and, and information to folks, uh, but that they were still lacking a lot of tooling and enablement. You know, they're still running, their companies were investing into it, right? We saw people building really big teams in this space to help their employees come in. Companies do view that as a lever of growth, right? If I need to go hire 100 people tomorrow, I need to put them somewhere. That's mm -hmm. real estate. And I need a way for them to come to those offices and, and even in the hybrid environment, you know, that created a whole new dynamic, but you still need to worry about how these people are coming in and that, where that kind of impacts your day-to-day -day productivity. So employers, you know, have that responsibility, but we saw that they, there's a gap that, that needs to be there and for us to really see how we can help employers as well as the employees. So let's say that, um, some through some miraculous event, I become the CEO of Apple Corporation. I got a lot of people I want to get back to the office. I got a problem. There's terrible traffic in the Bay Area. I don't know what to do about it. So I read something. I'm on the website and I see your website. I start investigating Fleet Labs and I say, yeah, I need to talk to them. I think I'm not sure. How can they help us? So I call you, you come into the office and what does that conversation sound like? Yeah, that's that's about the right time to have the conversation as well, I'll say. And and it is actually that time where we're in this, you know, we've been through a lot of, of many different pivots and, and a lot of different angles that you try as a business to see you know, where you can drive the most impact the fastest. Coming out of the pandemic, we've been part of these return to office conversations mm -hmm. for a while now. And then we've seen a few different waves of those come and go. But I will say that this by far is the strongest and, and biggest push that we've seen you know, since last year with not just the return to office, bringing questions like yours, but I need to bring my employees back. There's a lot more enforcement and mandating happening now to mm -hmm. not just encourage people back, but you know, the little carrot and stick approach of you have to come back now. There's a ton of pressure that companies are feeling from sustainability as well. Right. So if people are coming back to the office and at the same time, I'm being re required to report my sustainability metrics as an employer, as an organization, my employees commutes, albeit not in scope one or two falls into scope three of your emotions reporting is still a part of, of reporting and, and a part of the key metrics. And for some companies that have large employer footprints or employee footprints, it can it can go up. To, to represent a strong percentage of their carbon mm -hmm. footprint as a business. So that's important from there. And then the government compliance has also really kicked in. So, you know, we've seen from last year, large companies are being mandated, even 
as soon as last week, we had you know San Francisco, the governing authority that that enforces uh, compliance on programs like this. They've been they celebrated a ten year you know decade anniversary of of uh, our compliance laws have been around for ten years, but they kind of admitted that it's been a bit more complacent. And we cut employers a lot of slack, especially coming through the pandemic, which is completely mm-hmm. understandable. But now, you know, we really want you guys to get compliant and really you know, start to almost send them letters of non-compliance. Hey, what are you doing? You need to help your employees come to the office, run these programs that, that encourage you know, better behavior. And and where do where does Fleet Labs fit into that solution then? How do you help them? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, those are all the things that's causing people to come to the table. And then that's really the core point of interaction when they come to us. You know, there's luckily there aren't too many, you know, many options on how can I tackle commuting for my employees, right? Either it's companies that have teams in house that are going out and, and, and running programs themselves, or they're coming to understand, you know, how can I even start this from scratch or improve what I was doing? And that's really how we start when we sit down, you know, with an employer that comes to us, hey, I'm looking at bringing people back to the office. I want to ease them into it, or I need to reactivate some programs that I was running pre-pandemic and I need to now turn them on again. That's where we're really able to go in, see where your workforce is, right? Where do your, where your employees live, where your offices are. And we're able to, one, make sure that you at least run the programs that you need to for compliance. Right, let's check that box off, but let's do that in an effective way as well. So we found a way to really drive strong adoption and traction for employees, even part of this post-pandemic reactivation time. So we'll help them run, you know, make sure that you're running at least the bare minimum required. But we'll also go in and see what else can you do to, for your employees to help them you know, run more interesting programs that encourage different behavior. Right. So if you wanted to also bring options like bikes and scooters, right? And we'll work with them on this. So when you say, I want to bring back these 100,000 employees to my offices, what can I do? We take all that information and we automatically figure out what are the best combination of commuter programs and services that should be made available to your employees. And then we help them set that up and run it as well. Right? And this so, is a... Mm-hmm. It, if I, uh, again, I'm, I'm Tim Cook and I'm at Apple... Do you actually then sit down and say, here's the, <clears throat> excuse me, the bus lines that they need to take, and then they can hop on a scooter and go from point A to point B and get into your office? Or do you, do you actually help them configure and maybe lease buses to bring them in? Or if they're on the other side of the bay and they're in Oakland, hey, we've got these ferries that can bring them over and we're taking care of all those logistics for you. We'll line everything up and here's what your monthly bill is for that. Yeah, it's it's actually a combination of the two, but it, but you know you're in the right direction there exactly. So you know there's our biggest and most most sort of impactful program right now is this pre-tax commuter benefit program, which is where both employees and employers can take a portion of whatever they're spending on their commuting and save taxes on that, right? Which mm-hmm. is just part of the baseline. That's a IRS level national program. Anybody with a W two is eligible for it. But it's just been painful to administer and run and manage that program. So we've made it really easy to you know, flip that program on, both for administrators and for commuters who are coming back and, and trying to start spending on commuting. And that was a big part of the, the pushback that employers have been getting. Right? Employees have to restart commuting. They got used to staying at home and, and not having to spend on that. So it can be set up a way that it's almost a win-win program where, you know, whatever you're spending, you're saving money on that from taxes. Employers also save money because you know now the taxable income's gone down, so you're paying less payroll taxes. And everybody likes to save tax wherever they can. So this is you now that's a big one. And that also is a program that we've seen is applicable to everybody, not just the apples. You know, you you're coming to me with the potential bus plans. And we saw that earlier on. We were, you know, when we initially got our start, we were working with transportation teams at large companies like the Apples of the world but that have a lot of resources and a lot of programs and they've already invested and are currently investing a lot. But we saw that the transportation and commuting problem actually affects everybody, right? The freeways are, are full of people driving smaller companies and, and still getting stuck in traffic. So how can we really bring 
some of these powers and some of these programming that the Apples and Googles and Stanfords of the world have available to even, you know, 50 person companies or 100 person or a law firm or a construction company, right? People still have to commute. And that's a big part of what our proposition, you know, became because we saw that we can actually leverage technology to bring not only help the big companies run their programs more efficiently, which is the category that you spoke about. It'll help me figure out which programs make sense, like whether it's buses, bikes, scooters, um, it's parking programs or parking disincentives, you know, transit passes, figure out what program I need, help me manage it in one place, run it smoothly in one place, you know, make it easy for my employees to find it. And, and that's a big part of, of adoption is really making it easy and accessible, right? But can we also, while we're doing this for the large companies, can we take versions of these programs and make them, you know, even accessible to small companies that can now get those same superpowers? So let's say then that again, I, some through miraculous event, I have a 300 employee manufacturing company. I have to get people here all the time because we're manufacturing and we're around the clock, three shifts around the clock, seven days a week. And I'm having some problems because not just traffic, people commuting long distances and maybe they, their life is such that they can't afford new cars every two years and things like that. How do you come in and help that person? You identify the program, here's buses they can bring in and whatever. Here's the cost of doing that. But then do you administer the program also for them or do you turn that over to the company to administer the program? So we will do everything from the employer side and the employee side. Right? So we are we come sit on their side of the table where we're integrating into their data sources, into their you know HR systems, understanding where these workers are coming from, what the shift schedules look like, you know, what their current uh, sort of timelines and, and travel looks like. So we're able to do all of that. And then we become that conduit, that sort of middle person between the employer and their needs for their employees and this growing supply of all the different ways that people can move from mm-hmm. A to B. Mm-hmm. Right? So we become that central point of connection and that saves you know that employer from one, having to, you know, let me go first use one tool one service to set up this pre-tax program, which is not compliant. Now let me go and see what you know buses could look like to help my employees. Then I'm going to go, you know, do an RFP, talk to 10, 15 vendors, compare these things, run a process. If I want to do bikes and scooters, you know, which of these colored bikes and scooter services make sense for me? I had to go set up accounts at each of them and juggle them, and slowly I'm you know logging into 10 portals every month, juggling different invoices and. And that it's the it's a constant struggle of the people we we work with and, and people in HR because they want to do as much as they can for that person that is commuting because they're only coming and doing that commute for you to come to right. work and work for you and they want to do as much as they can empathetically as well but they know that for every new benefit or option they put in front there's a ton of this lagging you know admin that they have to do and on top of that to make that effective I really have to go out and, and educate people really make sure that the adoption comes in and they understand these options are available. And when is it too many options, right? Nobody's using any of them. So there's all these dynamics that you're playing with and we come and help them really centralize and streamline that, right? So streamlining everything from an admin perspective, centralizing access to all these programming and management and then partnerships, everything in one place. And even convenience is a huge one for us. We see a lot of we're used to a lot of convenience in our day-to-day life now with technology. Everyone's got a smartphone. We've got you know smart watches, and it's everywhere. And we're used to this convenience. But you know, if I have to go log into a company portal and check ten different tabs to see, you know, while I'm standing outside a scooter, whether I have a ten percent corporate discount for this service, I'm not going to do that, right? But if we can make that really, really convenient and at your fingertips, which is possible. And we can make it easy for administrators to not have to worry about adding new benefits and programs. Then we can help really surface the right options and still keep it flexible. We're not saying everybody should go do buses, everyone should go buy bike and scooters, and every commuter is different. 
right? The people that you identified. Sometimes you just live too far from a from a transit or any other service, and you have to drive, which we understand completely. Right? We want to first help the people that can take advantage of of better and and more convenient and healthier ways of moving. Let's help them immediately and see what else can we you know set up to help us broaden that reach and, and sort of impact as well. Is your primary target market, if you will, or client then bigger cities? bigger city organizations versus out in the country, the county? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that. And, and you know, a bigger driver towards that is really the fact that that's where the transportation bottlenecks and problems are also the most amplified, right? People getting stuck and getting bogged down by being stuck in traffic is very hot. And that sort of onus also then spills over to the employer because now your employees are unhappy because of their commutes, right? And if they're unhappy, your productivity is lower. If your productivity is lower, your business is not growing as much as you want, right? So that whole, you know, the, the backbone of, of people movement within cities is also where that consolidation of, of, you know, people coming together, the problem is a lot more bottleneck, but also where the investment of, of doing something about it is a lot more blatant in your face as well. Could I boil this down then and tell me if I'm oversimplifying this? What you're really doing is going in and saying, here's how you can use public transportation to lower your carbon footprint, take advantage of tax incentives, making it easier for your employees to actually commute and come into the office. And we take care of all the administration. We figure it out. We help you get your contracts in place. And then we do the administration for you, the administering of the program and communicating and things like that. And we just take that entire problem off your shoulders and we can do it for you very effectively. Is that a simple explanation? It, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. And then, and, and, you know, piggybacking off of that, you know, we immediately aren't even reinventing the wheel. We're, you know, we're, right. we're pioneering that pioneering again, we're pioneering the access to these programs. We're taking programs that exist, right? Buses have been around for a while. This pre-tax program has been around for a while. Transit has been running for a while. We take programs that exist and just make them a lot more enhanced, a lot more accessible. But yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. And, and, and we're doing what, what people, we don't want people to have to become transportation experts, right? Then they're, they're HR. And the same thing that happened with healthcare, right? Everybody gets amazing healthcare benefits, but there's no team within a company or within Apple in your company, there's no team of people calling hospitals or clinics to figure out what's the best program for healthcare program for my employees. Right? So we want to prevent that for happening in, in transportation as well. Okay. Okay. So I think I have a good understanding of the business, what you're doing, the benefit of the entire thing. And there is a tremendous benefit because it just brings so much more efficiency of time and effort and dollars and carbon footprint reporting and all of those things into a domain that I don't have to worry about investing in that in my business. I can rely on you. It just, it's one more thing that I don't have to pay attention to because all of our lives in business today is filled with fierce change and disruption one way or another. Every day, it's something else. So I'd like to move on now to another part of our conversation. And this is the interesting part. I want to learn more about you and your business. Obviously, if you're a pioneer and you're an entrepreneur, you have an inclination for adventure. You have an infant inclination for excitement and trying to solve big problems. There's a passion involved in that because nothing comes easy. Implementation is hard, but the ideas are easy. So looking back on your experience, I believe you started your business in 2018 and you're in the Bay Area. What was that experience like? Was the journey what you thought it would be or was it full of detours and different routes and a lot of unknowns coming up that you had to manage both emotionally and mentally? I don't think um, anybody who has been doing anything for more than maybe a month can attest to uh, the, the claim that everything went exactly how we thought it would <laughs> went according to plan. Uh, so definitely the latter, hundred percent the latter. Um, you know, and 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 that's actually fairly common for, like you said, anybody who's trying to pioneer anything or go after 
any novel approach to, to, to business or to an impact or to a product. Uh, and that's the general case. I think, you know, in, in our world and the timeline that you brought up as well, you know, not just were there the inherent challenges of building a something new and building a new business, uh, but we all, and all of us included, had to also navigate this new whole dimension of unknowns with the COVID pandemic okay. timeline, right? And and that obviously affected our lives day to day ubiquitously, everybody, but it also did shake the tree of transportation specifically quite aggressively too. Right? Mm -hmm. we, we saw a lot of commuting come to a standstill for, for a significant amount of time. And there were some good highlights to that. You know, people were happier to see more birds out, water was cleaner in Venice. Like we saw some really interesting, you know, snippets of of what the world can look like without everybody driving every day and, and feeling that angst of commuting. Um, but that entire realm brought its own level of obstacles and hurdles and, and jumps that we had to tackle in addition to just, you know, building a new business and startup. So it was definitely a big roller coaster storm tornado all in one you know uh, adventure to say the least okay so let's 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 dive into one experience here you're starting a business you're getting getting some footing it's 2018 you started it's an idea so now all of a sudden you start getting a couple of contracts you see okay this solution does work this idea does seem to work but in the distance you're hearing that uh chi in china there's some people getting sick and then you hear New York City, there are really people are calling off and you're sitting there at night with your co-founders, your employees and saying, uh, what's going on here? And you see this wave starting to come in and all of a sudden the government says, shut down your business. Whether you want to or not, you're shutting down your business unless you have a dire necessity type of product or service that you're offering. What emotions did you feel and those around you in the business as that wave of uncertainty and shutdown started to come through? What was the emotional experience like? Yeah, that's a very good, very good point. And just you walking through that that timeline really did put me back in, in exactly you know that moment in time. So it is it is getting a lot more uh, easier to relate and remember the emotions now that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sitting back in that that time travel we just did it was it was that it was exactly that we you know walking through we had kicked things off we got some quick traction going we proven some some points and we were really excited about the direction we were building momentum towards this is you know 2019 as well going into early 2020 in fact and and uh, I actually remember we even did you know a, a quick you know, small round of, of uh, financing at the early onset of 2020. And I even remember the last, you know, check coming in, that's why are coming in. And really a week after that, we we were all at that standstill moment. It was, you know, early Feb, March. And, and it, we you were right. We saw inklings of something happening, but it was very much, you know, there's just news, there's stuff outside. As a lot of founders normally do, you kind of have to throw the blinders on at times and just, you know, focus on, on what's in front of you and we did that until you couldn't ignore it anymore and it was just an actual pause for for everybody coming in and um yeah i mean tactically for us we really had to pause and and think about everything right i think the only saving grace was that we hadn't started to scale aggressively you know get a big office lease hire 50 people like the month before Right. And then you're sitting there really having to think, but, but now you have this massive onus to think very quickly and, and massive burden to, to react. I think emotionally, it was definitely a bit of a wreck for sure. I think, you know, to say that uh, you were stumped, you were really kind of think, feeling that everything that you've been working towards is now, you know, moved. Like it's, it's, you're kind of starting from, from square one you really have to analyze what this looks like. Right? And initially it was a very much a, hey, let's pause and see. Let's let, there was a bit of that waiting game, I think in the early phase when we were still going through the first wave and uh, even a couple months into it, you know, we were 
very anxious. Everyone's really kind of thinking through what to do. We were being proactive from our end, and and you know we, and that was part of the positive, I think, aspect of things. Like there was a lot of angst, there was a lot of uncertainty, which we're used to dealing with as founders. We do that on a day to day, even if there wasn't a pandemic. I'm uncertain as a new founder of a new business, what this business will look like a month from now, what I'm doing two months from now. That's something where we've built the skill to, to handle and, and still manage to make progress with. But in that scenario was really this brand new variable of things out of your control completely, right? Things that, that were kind of forced upon you. Um, and there was a bit of a waiting game, which I think was likely the most, probably the worst period to, to have to go through, right? Like we're already, you're really scrambling and, and making sure you're moving as fast as you can to get, to breathe life into this business and really grow it. But at the same time, the rest of the world and the macroeconomic kind of uh, movement is very much pause, right? And, and and everyone's in that scenario. So I think that was probably the hardest to get through, um, even emotionally, mentally, and like you said, even with, with the team, right? To get, to convey that one, to get yourself composed and convinced of what you believe will happen or what you believe is, is a good strategy to get everybody through it. But then to have that voiced out and to convince others about it is, is a whole new dimension as well. Let, let's dig into this just a little bit deeper and unwrap it a little. Did you ever have the experience? I know an awful lot of entrepreneurs have. You, during the day, you're sounding confident. You're putting the face and the identity on that you need. You go home at night. You go to bed. If I may use these words, just say, holy shit, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden it's two o'clock in the morning and you wake up and that, oh my God, turns into a panic. It's like a mist that comes in and it's just panic. Like all of a sudden the emotions of anxiety kind of overtake you. Was that something that you ever felt? That sounds pretty, that, that sounds pretty intense, but I do think a version of that for sure. I think, okay. I think, it, you know, the, the concept behind that hundred percent, like, you know, you are, uh, you are the biggest champion of the business at any point in time, right? That has to be your job, whether it's with the employees, whether it's with the customer, you know, whoever you're dealing with, you know, you have to, at the very core, believe what you're working on and be almost delusionally optimistic that this is going to work. Right. And then I love that, that term, by the way, delusionally it's, optimistic. <laughs> It's good. <laughs> I think, you know, it, it came to me a while back, but it really became part of the core. And, and whenever I had to justify something, it felt easy to be like, no, you know, this is, this is the only way it's going to get done. And it's fine. You can, you know, mark it off to, to that attribute. But I think that's, that's a core skill to help you really keep driving, right? Persistence and kind of going at all odds is important. So when you felt those moments of anxiety, Things were out of your control. You didn't know how to bring them back in. How did you get yourself under control? How did you manage that change in yourself? Did you have a partner to talk to, partners to talk to? Did you just sit down and take a long walk? I mean, how did you get yourself back to that reasoning frame of mind to say, wait a minute, the value we're bringing is real. There is a need. This is a temporary bump in the road. How did you get yourself back to that, that sane if you will, balanced measure of reason and emotion. Mm. I think saying is questionable even after you reach that that mode for sure. But definitely, definitely uh, more reasonable. And I think reason is actually reason and logic is normally what acts as a strong tool in those scenarios, right? To to be able to when you are having emotional reactions, which you know emotions are also important and they can fuel lot right there is the positive stress concept of you know diamonds are built under pressure so when you have good pressure you know you can really hammer at it so there are ways to leverage it but i think whenever there's negative emotions and, and finding a way to to continue to paddle in those scenarios i think you know acknowledging that these are emotions versus you know using relying more heavily on logic and, and reason like to your point you want to try to get to that vision of yeah here were the things that are positive that I can go back to and, and use to you know refuel that. I think the reason logic is huge one. I think that's also a part of my wiring that I've realized over time, like personally, that I am, you know, I can more easily resort to 
using reason and, and logic to, to kind of take decisions and, and migrate myself to where I need to go. Um, but I think, yeah, to your point, you know, there it's still very hard in a lot of scenarios and everybody develops, everybody has to develop, especially as a founder, as a, as a business owner, as someone who is in that high capacity decision-making role. I mean, you have to develop coping mechanisms and, and strategies and there's always a host of them, right? I think the mantra for, for founders, at least what they, what they say everywhere, it's definitely you know, make sure you're working out every day or getting some s- cycle of consistency and semblance. And, and it is a nice, easy win. And I've, I've leveraged that a bunch. You know, you, today I'm, I'm working the same muscle more than I was last week. So I've seen progress. I'm, I'm maintaining some form of consistency with an activity that, that keeps you fuel. So I think working out is a great mechanism. And then the support network, you know, for me personally as well, like you mentioned, this is, is a big part. You know, we're very close to my family. They always know the ins and outs, the ups and downs that's happening, business, work, personal life. And just having a, a solid support network across friends or family and, and, or a partner is definitely you know, a big crutch that, that can be a catalyst. But at the end of the day, it still has to come. I think it still has to be, a, a, you know, an internal calibration and internal system and all of these things can help you make that path easier. But I think a lot of it is still rests on, on you kind of recognizing, realizing and navigating. Well, my congratulations to you because you've articulated how you would deal with those high anxiety type of situations. And not a lot of people can articulate it like that. You say, hey, I'm physical exercise, family support system is important talking to myself, knowing I have to get to reason and out of emotion. That's very valuable for other entrepreneurs and business owners to recognize because we all go through that, but not all of us know how to get out of it or manage through that. And then in turn, by doing that, you manage your employees in that way. Because let's face it, if you have uncertainty and anxiety, emotions are contagious. They have them too. And they're relying on you to make the decisions that keep them safe. So those same, I'm going to say, support mechanisms to keep them balanced between rational reasoning and emotion are really what you drive to get change put in place. So my congratulations for articulating that the way you have. I would ask then, what experiences in your life, in your background, your family, Helped you plant that seed so you could see this is what I need to do to get through this real rough patch in life that I'm going through right now. Any outstanding events that you could look at and say, well, these were important triggers and they kind of framed my beliefs and how I deal. Here was a role model I had that taught me how to deal with certain situations. Yeah, that's, it's quite a good question. And and I think, you know, had I known we were we were gonna you know dig into a, a deeper therapy session, I, I probably would have spent a bit more time thinking through it. But even on the spot, no, and I think this is a very good good uh, way to think about it. I think there definitely has been a lot of influence. I think a lot of how people grow up and and you know parts of the core memories and core experiences that define folks really do dictate how they think, what mental framework they have, and and what they end up kind of partaking in and how much, you know, risk-taking appetite they have. Um, you know, for me, even thinking that I could just go, you know, work on a business, work on a brand new idea, build a startup, to kind of do what I want to do, came also, i pretty sure, from from my parents, you know, watching them take a lot of risks as a family with, with us together. And well before I understood what we were doing, right? I think when I got older and then, I actually did have conversations with them about, hey, how did you guys think about this move? Or, you know, we moved on a lot as a, as a family. We did a lot of different interesting, you know, we were curious. We'd always go explore different places. We travel a lot. Um, and there were a lot of these decisions that, you know, we were obviously included as a package, me and my, and my younger brother. Um, but as I got older, I asked them a lot about how this decision making happened and started to understand. I mean, some of it was just, natural instinct even for them and they weren't even able to articulate or tell me how i can think about that so i can recreate that let's say you know for my kids or or for you know how to think about that for the future but i think 
they were definitely big influences in my life. I think us as a family going through hard times or going through tricky moments, like you said, whenever you've seen, you know, we learn from doing as people, right? We can read as much as we want. We can watch and, and you know, see, like learn as much as we want from other secondary sources. But, you know, until you've gone and really you know, touched the stove and, and gotten burned, you, you know it's hot, but you'll still go do it, right? Until we have that immediate feedback. So I think your point is exactly right. I think the experiences that have shown us getting through tougher times, which in my case did involve the support network, family, and you know that sort of encouragement got us through previous times. And it automatically became a formula for me to know that this works. So when I'm in a harder time, I can go rely on, on this data point. And I know that that has helped me before. There's strong reason that it should help me in this you know, new scenario as well. Um, this is excellent. Um, let's move this now into the business going in to the future. You've been tested. You st number one, you started a brand new business and you started it with a brand new idea. So that takes an awful lot of courage. Congratulations. You walked into the arena, COVID hit. That was your battle in the arena. You may have blinked, but you stayed up. You stayed standing. Here you are today. You made your way through it. That has that says an awful lot about you and your leadership team and the validity of your idea and the concept. That's excellent. So now it's time to start, I'm going to say, scaling your business. All the lessons that you learned. You walked through COVID, you, you were in the arena, and you, were a, you weren't an observer. You were the participant, the person in that arena, and you went through those times. So now, how are you using all of that knowledge that you gained, everything that you learned, how are you using that to build your business? And in particular, how are you using it to frame your culture? What is your culture like that you want to develop and what kind of people would be attracted to that culture in your mind? That's a great question. And, and I think even constantly, like this is definitely us one point in time, you know, reflecting and looking back, but I think we at any moment in time are a, a summation of all the experiences up until that moment, right? Even week over week, like stuff that happened you know, a few weeks ago is likely influencing me in whichever way today. Uh, and to your point, going through all of those more key and pivotal moments and timelines has definitely had a big role in, in you know, where we are today. It, it, even me as personal, you know, where I am today and what I'm able to do. And, I feel very fortunate to to be sitting here having this conversation and, and have a you know, brilliant team that we're building, great solution, a great problem that we're really able to to solve and, and bring to life for the world. So I feel you know at a high level, and that's also another coping mechanism I've used a lot. You know, go back to the higher level when when the small bumps on the road are are feeling a bit too mm -hmm. bumpy or it's getting too much. You go up to the bird watching you on that road and and, and see that literal bird's eye view and, and you're happy about the road, the path that you're on, it, it really helps you. You kind of take a step up and, and feel feel better and, and then you can come back in and navigate mm -hmm. the bumps. But I think that's a big part of how we, you know, where we are. And that's part of the culture. I think to your point, you know, we've, it's a bit harder to see when you're in there and navigating, right? We're, you're playing the survival game coming out of the pandemic. We're finding every which way to keep moving forward. And we really got that pulse check. And I myself realized that, you know, kind of look in the mirror when we, you know, would put our head out and maybe talk to investors or other stakeholders who haven't been you know, in the day to day. And we actually got a lot of folks that were from the outside in very impressed that we survived, made it through where we are now and mm -hmm. found another yet new interesting challenge that we're going after. And seeing that outside in actually is what helped bring that back up that, yeah, you're right. Like that is part of our culture. That is part of our nature. You know, we are very persistent. Right? We, um, until we are fully convinced that, you know, in this scenario, we were convinced that there is a problem that needs to be fixed, right? And, and, it, and by fixing that problem, there is an outsized amount of impact that can be created. So this conviction, you know, there were a lot of bumps on the way that questioned how we can fix this problem and you know what what's the best right way to fix it and different angles and different ideas and features and solutions but those are just small tools in your arsenal that you use but 
I think our, our conviction to actually tackle this problem and the impact that this problem has stayed the same. And I think that is a big part of what we know helped us get where we are. And it's part of the culture going forward, right? To your point of, of the kind of folks we attract. And it is fairly natural. People see that, I think, at this point when we interact with each other and we're, we're growing the team, we're really trying to you know, bring on people in every facet, from sales to engineering to just opportunistically strong people. And they see the tenacity that the team has. They see that you know we've we've managed to get through a lot of whirlwinds and storms to get where we're at, and we are you know determined to do something about this problem, right? And and where that goes, we want to collectively come together and and see where we can take it, right? And that's really it. We're you know looking for that buy-in, looking for folks that are can get excited about the deeper you know problem at hand about solving and building great solutions. You know, we don't have to be convinced that what we're building today is the perfect solution for this five years from now. We don't know that answer. Nobody really does. And even big companies are always looking for ways to evolve and change. The core thing that has to really drive you is, you know, are you either motivated by this problem that you really want to solve or, you know, you're really passionate about this space and, and what you can do in it and want to find the right, you know, way to, to navigate that too. And what value do you place in, in attracting those people? And you articulate they got to be passionate. They got to get energized over about overcoming obstacles. They got to dig in. We got to do the hard work. We got to show up for work every day more so than our competitors. We've got some new ideas. We have to prove them. So it's a very exciting culture and environment, no question. How important is emotional intelligence in making this all work in your mind? Oh, it's, I think it's quite important, um, especially at the earlier stages, right? At the foundational stages, at the early leadership level, I think it is a, it is a very vital part of what will help you succeed in this environment. But I will also caveat that it is a, a really tough one to find and, and to, to even assess, right? Without me getting stuck in an airport with the person for, you know, two days or something. Mm -hmm. it, it's a tough, uh, tough, tough way to really vet for that. And, and it is something that you, you find whatever signals you can, but it really comes. And then I think there, the bigger influence is also what you, what we briefly touched on early, where the way I'm feeling, the way you're feeling, the way you act, the framework, it, it can be felt by others around you. And, and there's, you know, a bit of permeation and, and kind of spreading that, that we can do. But I think it is very important because of the uncertainty that's involved in those stages, right? And, and the conviction that's needed. So understanding, you know, small hits and misses don't knock you off fully, right? Like if you're, and when you're getting sales, for example, that's a very ruthless space to be in, right? You're going to get a hundred no's, maybe a thousand no's before you get the first yes. And you have to have very high level of, of EQ to that effect and, and almost, you know, be convinced that not one no is not going to change my entire thinking about this and it's going to knock out my, my week or my afternoon. Right? So I think it is a very vital uh, attribute and, and a lot more impactful at the earlier stages and sort of the startup or economic kind of a, the culture of a team as well. Mm -hmm. Looking now at the future, putting it all together, you've got goals. You get feedback that explains how you're doing. Your goals, in effect, direct what you're doing. You get someone's emotion and EQ involved because emotions drive performance. You put your ecosystem in place is what we call that, those three things, your goals, your emotional temperament, managing and, and guiding that along with all the feedback coming in. What's the future look like for you, Sharia, and fleet um, organization? Yeah, I think, um, no, that's a very good, good question. I think the future looks really exciting for us and for myself. I think, you know, we've, to your point, made it through a lot of, uh, interesting times to say the least. And it's not, it's only gotten us more fired up about everything that we're doing, about everything that we believe in and the timing aspect, which has always been, you know, out of your control. You're building a business, you know, there's, things that you do right and then there's all the other things that are not in your control that you don't have and timing 
uh, you know, market, the economy, all these things are, are much more out of your control. And for us, it just since about last year, everything just seems to starting to kind of fit in the right way. You know, we're really starting to see uh, a convergence of, of different waves and, and different needs and, and demands. And that's really what's you know the most exciting for us, where we finally feel like we're not fighting against the tide, but we're really riding this, surfing this tide. And it's really up to us to see where we can take this. So we're, we're really pumped and, and we know there's a lot, a lot of work to be done. Yeah, man, I think, I think you're going to have a lot of success in your future, Sharia. You've got some really, really good concepts that you're bringing down to earth. People can understand them. You're providing a good service, just not producing revenue, but I mean, it's benefiting communities and affecting individuals in their lives. So I think, uh, I think you got a lot of good things ahead of you. And I think you're a very smart person and you've learned to navigate some of the worst, worst detours and disruptions, you know, that we've ever had. So my congratulations to you. Um, if somebody wants to talk to you, they want to get in touch with you, they want to apply for a job. What's the best way to get in touch with you? I would say, you know, my, my inbox is always open, you know, hit me up on LinkedIn, look at our, our company where, you know, move with, move with fleet.com. Go to our website. You know, you can learn a little bit more about us. Uh, but you definitely feel free to reach out to me. You can even you know, email me directly, sure, at, at movewithfleet.com or connect with me on LinkedIn or other website. But we're always looking to hear from from folks that are excited about what we're doing and you know, want to be part of it in whatever capacity. Well, you've got me excited and I'd love to be a part of it because I'd love to talk to you again in the future and just monitor your progress and report on your progress. So Shari, I want to thank you for your time. It's been a really interesting conversation. And I know I've learned a lot. You've educated me. And I think you've done the same for a lot of our listeners. So I appreciate your time and your input. And uh, very excited to see what you do in the future. Thanks, Ted. No, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here and a very thoughtful conversation. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have a few more lingering thoughts that will creep up uh, closer, to, closer to bedtime. And, uh, but, but it's been a very good and refreshing conversation to have. Thank you. Best of luck in the future. Thank you. Appreciate it. You too. Hi, Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this Implementers video. The Implementers podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.